Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Shofa and I am a volunteer for UKIM and I've been a volunteer for UKIM for a number of years. I am from the Cleathley branch and this is my first talk, so please forgive me for my mistakes and correct them if needed. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa khlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is the topic we are covering today. Key points, significance and the lessons. So one of the best stories from the seerah that gave hope to the Ummah were the narratives of al hudaybiyah The golden event should be an inspiration for all Muslims with deep thought. So a significant incident in the history of Islam, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was signed in the sixth year after Prophet ﷺ and his followers left for Mecca. So despite their victory in the Battle of Badr, which we spoke about, which one of the sisters spoke about in the previous talk, um, despite their victory of the Battle of Badr, the Muslims during that time were still not strong enough to attack the pagans of Mecca, but they wished to visit the Holy Kaaba and perform tawaf, And it was this pivotal treaty that the Prophet ﷺ and the Quraysh tribe that had signed um, at that time. There were many benefits of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, including reducing the tensions between the Quraysh and the Muslims and affirming peace. Moreover, it was the result of this agreement that the Prophet ﷺ and the followers were allowed to enter Mecca the following year for what became to be known as the first pilgrimage, the first Umrah. So the history of the Treaty of al hudaybiyah After leaving Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ saw a dream. He dreamt that he performed tawaf around the Kaaba. The companions were delighted when the Prophet ﷺ told them about the dream. So the Prophet ﷺ and 1,400 companions marched peacefully with their arms sheathed in their pockets towards Mecca to perform Umrah. They were dressed as pilgrims and bought their animals to sacrifice, hoping the Quraysh would honour the Arabian custom of allowing pilgrims to enter the city. So the Muslims left the city of Medina in a state of ihram. Now this is a physical and a spiritual state which restricts their freedom of action, it pro prohibits fighting and that indicated that they came with peace, that they didn't come to fight. On the way to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ stopped, camel stopped and sat down and she would not move. Does anybody know the name of the Prophet ﷺ's camel? Can anybody tell me the name? You can unmute, in, unmute yourself or um, just write in the chat box. The name of the Prophet ﷺ's camel. Anybody have any idea? Good guess, but it wasn't the Burak. The Prophet ﷺ's camel was called Qaswa. So the companions were concerned as to why she wouldn't move. The Prophet ﷺ said she only moves by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has something in store for us so we can't enter Mecca. We have to wait. So they waited. Meccans, however, had found out that the Prophet ﷺ was near Mecca with all his companions. So they were very concerned. So the Quraysh had sent leaders, governors of different tribes and representatives to negotiate with the Prophet ﷺ and find out why they had come. So a tribe leader that came to negotiate. Now the people that the Quraysh had sent were just wasn't ordinary. They weren't ordinary people. They were leaders. They were governors. They were very prominent people that the Quraysh had sent um, to the Prophet ﷺ to see um, why why they had come. So when they went, they saw that the Prophet ﷺ had not come to fight. They had their weapons sheathed in their pockets and they were in their ihram. So they were in the state of um, the physical and spiritual state of ihram where they were prohibited of fighting and doing any of those actions that were displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which indicates that they came in peace and not to fight. The representatives, when they saw, whatever they saw, they were in awe 
that they saw that the companions had treated the Prophet ﷺ with so much honour and so much respect. They had seen many kings and leaders, but none of their people treated their kings as the companions had treated the Prophet ﷺ. They noticed that during the wudu uh, of Salah, they would rush to collect the water from his mouth to rub on themselves. They were amazed by this behaviour. And, and when the Prophet ﷺ spoke to his companions, they looked down, humbling themselves. They had so much respect and so much admiration for their Prophet. They went back to tell the Quraysh um, that the, the Prophet ﷺ and the companions had come in peace and to let them enter Makkah and do tawaf. So the Prophet ﷺ, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, had already earned their, um, the respect of these leaders and governors and earned the respect because of what they saw. So when they went to speak to the Quraysh and said to let them enter Makkah, the Quraysh refused to listen to their advice. So eventually, the Prophet ﷺ then sent one of his companions, Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, to go and speak to the Quraysh. So Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, had been gone for a while now. So the Muslims were greatly worried that the Meccans had captured Uthman and killed him. This angered the Prophet ﷺ very much. And all of the companions took a pledge at the hand of the Prophet ﷺ that they would sacrifice their lives to avenge the death of the companion. Their pledge, uh, this pledge was given by the name of Bayt al-Ridwan, which was under a tree. The Quraysh had found out about this and sent a governor from Taif to negotiate a truce between them and the Muslims. This was this consequence that led to the well-known treaty um, of Al-Hudaybiyah. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, was the scribe of the treaty. So he wrote on the treaty, this peace treaty is between Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the messenger of Allah. Suhail ibn Amr, who was sent to negotiate the treaty, rejected saying this, had we witnessed you and believed in you, we would not have been fighting you. We would have allowed you to enter Makkah. So we don't want to have this written on the scribe, the messenger of Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu asked Ali uh, to rub it, rub it off. But Ali refused to rub it off. So Prophet ﷺ asked Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, tell me where you have written this. As the Prophet ﷺ was illiterate, he could not read. So he ﷺ, rubbed his name off himself. So the terms of the treaty included the following. The Prophet ﷺ and the companions were to go back and not perform Umrah this year, but to come back the following year to perform Umrah and only stay for three days. The Quraysh and the Muslims to come to truce, they kept to come to truce for 10 years and refrain from fighting and avoid um, provoking one another. If anyone from the Quraysh goes to join the Muslims, they shall be returned back to the Quraysh. But if anyone goes from the Muslims to the Quraysh, he shall not be sent back. The Muslims and the Quraysh would be free to sign any alliances, treaties with any tribes around Arabia. And also the last, the Muslims shall not come back. So when they come back the following year, they are not to bring any swords. And if they are to have them sheathed in their pockets. So um, that was the terms of the treaty. Now, during the during the treaty, Abu Jandal, son, uh, Abu Jandal, son of Suhail, the person negotiating this treaty, had escaped from the imprisonment of his father because he had become a Muslim. So his father had imprisoned him and captured him and put him in the dungeon. Now he had escaped to join the Muslims. Suhail was furious and caught hold of him. The Prophet Wasallam asked Suhail to allow him to stay, but Suhail refused and said, it was the part of the treaty, although at the time the treaty had not even been signed. The Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Jandal, be patient and control yourself. Surely Allah will make a way out for you and for the oppressed. We have bound ourselves to, this, uh, for the, to the people of Quraysh and given them the covenant and we'll, we will not break it. So what does this show us and teach us about the Prophet ﷺ's character during this incident?
what was his character like during his in this incident of the whole treaty? What did you see? What did you notice about his character? What what qualities did he, did he show? Um, you can unmute, unmute yourself or write in the chat box about his character. There are so many things, so many amazing things that he showed and portrayed. Can anybody name any? Yes, yeah, super steadfastness. That's that's exactly what he did. He was very steadfast. Anything else? Patient. Very much. A lot of patience. He showed a lot of patience during this time of difficulty. Anything else? Respecting the covenant, definitely, de definitely respecting the covenant when he turned down Abu Jandal, when the covenant wasn't even signed at the time and he turned down showing that he's already abiding by the covenant, he's already abiding by the terms even though it wasn't already um, signed, showing will, uh, strong, strong willed resilience, definitely, yeah, respecting the covenant, yeah, these are amazing things that he showed, these are amazing qualities that he showed. So he did, he showed all of these, he showed epitome of gentlemanship. Um, although being the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, did he didn't show any arrogance. Yet yeah, forgiveness, he, he did, he forgave, he gave, he, he, sorry, he forgave the um, arrogance of the representatives. Yeah, definitely. He showed great leadership at the times of difficulties. He showed extreme humbleness, as somebody said, very hum uh, humbleness um, for the peace of the people, especially when he rubbed his name off, being the messenger of Allah and rubbing his name off, he showed great humbleness, um, honouring the representative of Quraysh, even though they were being so disrespectful and being so unfair, um, he still honoured them. His honesty and determination to abide by the treaty that was so in, unfavorable towards the Muslims because the all the terms that they had they had um, set was so unfavorable and seemed so unfair. He showed great resilience, as somebody said, um, and perseverance in great difficult situations. So the Prophet ﷺ saw the bigger picture when he turned down Abu, Abu Jandal. He, uh, he, he, he saw the bigger picture that even if he returned him, something good was to come out of it. So when the document was signed and finished, the Prophet ﷺ ordered the companions to slaughter their animals and shave their heads and take off their garments of ihram. Due to the immense um, depression and sadness that the companions were feeling, nobody listened to the command. They felt extreme loss on their behalf. The treaty seemed really, really unfair. So they were so sad um, and so depressed, especially because they came with the hope of wanting to perform Umrah. And now that hope, they had no hope of that left. Um, they were so disheartened. They also felt that they may receive a revelation from Jibreel alayhi salam. in the hope of that they remained silent and didn't obey. So it was very rare for any of the companions uh, not to obey the Prophet sallallahu So he was shocked by their behaviour. He went into his tent to express his grief to his wife Umm Salama. So she advised him to do as he commanded the companions to do and they would automatically follow his actions. Taking her advice, her very wise advice, the Prophet Sallallahu slaughtered his animals, he shaved his head and he took off his ihram. Seeing this, the companions immediately followed and did the same. So what lesson can we learn about the status of a woman in Islam in this through this encounter? And what um, does the Prophet Sallallahu conversation with Umm Salma radiallahu anhu teach us about the role of Islam in women? What does he show us about a role, how we should treat a woman, um, how the Prophet ﷺ treated his wives? Very respectful, definitely, Rubina, very respectful. He was very respectful. He he uh, listened to their advice. Um, they were very, very wise. So he always gave them an attentive ear. He always seeked advice. Brilliant, Aisha, yeah. Sister Rubina, intelligent. They were very intelligent, yeah. So he lis she listened. Prophet always listened and took advice. 
from his wives. They were very intelligent. They were very wise. Also, um, before Islam, women were treated as second class citizens. They were very good advisors. Yep, yeah, sister. Um, before Islam, when women women was treated as second class citizens um, who did not have the right to own property or have their own wealth, it was even seen as a burden and disappointment uh, for people to have daughters instead of sons. However, Islam showed us the importance of women's status and how they play a key role. And uh, Sister Tania says he valued her thoughts. Definitely he did as he took her advice and they are equal partners. So um, so women play a, a, a very a supreme role within the society, whether that be a wife, a mother, a daughter or a sister. Uh, Saba, Sister Saba says giving women high status by first asking his wife advice and then took her advice. Yep, that's exactly what he did. And this and this can be seen how um, they are treated with this so much respect and honour in so many stories and ahadith, such as the story that we are listening to today. The Prophet وسلم, took advice from his wives and held their opinion in high regard. They were great companions and wives. Yeah, he did not. Dis he was never dismissive and gave them an attentive ear, showing us that they are our trustworthy confidants. And to relegate the status of a woman would be against the teaching of our Prophet Wasallam. Yeah, they were sources of peace and tranquility because all the advice that they gave was always for the benefit of the Ummah, um, for the bigger picture. They never saw um, their personal gains in anything. All they saw was what was better for the Ummah, what, Allah, what would be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they, they always um, had that in mind when they gave advice. So on their journey back to Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a special surah. And this surah gave peace to the Muslim ummah um, and gave them uh, contentment to the hearts of the believers at this time when their heart felt so disheartened, they felt a heavy load. They were returning back to Medina from Mecca and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, sent at that time a special surah. Can you name the surah which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed to them? Which surah was revealed at the time of um, them returning back to Medina after this incident? Super Sister Aisha said Surah al fath That's exactly the surah that was revealed. Surah al fath uh, Sister Ubeda also said it as well. Yeah, Surah al fath was revealed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah, surely we have given you a manifest victory. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive you for your sins of the past and future and complete his blessings on you and guide you on the straight path. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may help you with a mighty help. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already saying that you have gained victory. You have gained this special um, victory through just by abiding by this um, treaty. So through this incident and through all of this um, hardship, what? What does this teach us about our our character? What should our character be like um, in times of difficulties and hardship? How should like the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions how 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 hard how much hardship they went through and the struggles they went through and how they portrayed their character? What character? How should our character be like um, when we are going through difficulties and when we are going through hardship? Definitely, Sister Aisha, complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Definitely, that's what that's one of the most important things that um, we need to have is complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What other kind of qualities should we have? Even looking at the treaty and thinking about how their character was during this treaty that seems so unfair. And when something is happening in our lives, um, when we think that something unfair is happening, what kind of um, character should we portray? Because sometimes we we get really angry and we get frustrated. Um, how should how we should we show um, definitely believing in the Qadr and having sabr, sister Emma said sabr, definitely sabr is one of the most important um, 
things that we should portray. Sister Tanya said patience as well, keeping calm. Definitely all of those qualities are supreme. So that was Surah Fad. Sorry, I forgot about this slide. So patience in times of difficulties, steadfastness in propagating the deen, good words to call people to Islam, um, reliance in Allah's plan and showing perseverance. A lot of you sisters have mentioned all of this. Fighting and war is not only the way to win, and you can do this with peaceful talk, as the Prophet ﷺ had shown um, during this treaty, that you can win the war. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fat, you've already gained victory just by the peaceful talk and, and agreeing and having sabr and patience. They did not have to raise a sword. They did not have to fight. And making it priority to always keep our word, even if it's not in our favor, as the Prophet ﷺ um, honored the treaty, even though it's unfavorable. So even when we are making promises to people and we are, um, when someone trusts us with something, we have to do our best to keep that trust. We have to prioritize and keep our word, even, even if we feel as if we are going through a loss through it. So the benefits of the treaty were, through this th treaty, there were so many benefits and just a few are listed here. Spreading Islam in Arabia, so Islam spread, spread far and vast, um, saving lives of the Quraysh people, protecting Muslim lives in Mecca and recognizing the power of Islam in Arabia. So all these things were the benefits of the treaty. Among them were many more. So through this story, um, through this story, what do we learn? What was the moral of the story? What was the moral of everything that happened? What lessons can we learn from this story of Al Hudaybiyah? What lessons can we learn? And a, a, a couple of sisters already mentioned that trusting in Allah's plan, trusting in the Qadr. What other lessons can we learn from this story? trusting Allah's plan, even if it seems as though it's displeasing to you, believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always knows the best and will bring out the best of outcome. So even though the, the treaty seemed unfair, but Allah knows, Allah knows the bigger picture. He knows what's coming. He knows the future. Victory isn't this dunya, says Sister Tanya. Definitely victory is, um, it can, it's in the dunya, they get, Mashallah, they got victory in the dunya and obviously in the hereafter. Uh, temporary compromise leads to big victories. Definitely, definitely, most definitely. They, that was a temporary compromise that seemed really unjust and unfair. But the bigger picture was um, it led to a big victory. And only, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw this and the Prophet sallallahu also saw this. So um, for a Muslim, it's to win uh, it's a win-win situation, definitely is um, that patience can resolve problems. Raising sword and fighting is not always the solution to problems. And despite, despite all the challenges, the Prophet ﷺ chose not to fight, but to use peaceful talk. Honouring agreements, one of the sisters said, which is very, very important. The Prophet ﷺ abided by every single word of the agreement, even though it was not in favour of the Muslims. And us as Muslims, we should learn to value commitments as the Prophet Sallallahu did because sometimes we say things with our mouth and it's just a mouth say we don't mean um, to make sure that when we do some, when we do say we're going to do something to value that to the end. The Prophet Sallallahu saw the vision that his companions failed to see, which was an opp opportunity to strengthen community and help um, help the community to flourish. So he saw the bigger picture to see how Islam would flourish through um, through this treaty. And the, lastly, the lessons from the Treaty of Hudaybia. So Hudaybia is still a very important um, history in Islam. After signing the treaty, Quraysh no longer thought that Prophet ﷺ was a rebel from Mecca. So Quraysh also accepted Medina as an Islamic state. This shows one should work with diplomacy, not with war. This treaty helped Islam to flourish in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. After the treaty, Muslims were now the first time recognized as an independent, powerful entity. 
So this opened doors for Dawa. People would embrace Islam in tens of thousands. There were open trade. Uh, Muslims were greatly tested with their faith, but they remained steadfast in the hardest of times. So um, Islam was spreading everywhere. Um, and because of the treaty of the 10 years that they were allowed, uh, they weren't allowed to fight. So there were no fear of war. There were no fear of fighting. People practice Islam. They gave Dawah without any fear of war. And that was the biggest victory that Islam spread everywhere with no fear. And um, yeah, so this brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I hope you have a bit more understanding about the significant incident of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and the Im amazing impact it had. Um, this talk uh, has finished sooner than I anticipated, so if anyone would like to include anything, um, you are most welcome. Or if you'd like to ask any questions, I'll try to answer. Mashallah, Sister Shofa, this is Saba. Um, and I'm so, so, so glad that you agreed to to talk tonight. Um, I know this is your first time on online uh, and it's always quite daunting when you can't see your um, attendees, but you've done so very well. Uh, I know we've uh, finished early, but I think you've picked up uh, all the important things and the lessons that you've uh, bullet point, all the lessons that we can learn from uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And the biggest, biggest lesson is that we plan and Allah plans and Allah is the pl best planner. So even when we are planning something, we must realize that there could be a plan made by Allah that can totally turn the whole picture uh, 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 around. Uh, and we should be prepared for that. Sometimes, I remember when we were young, if there is a picnic plan, it, it went wrong and we could not go for whatever reason. We used to get extremely uh, uh, upset about it. So we have to teach our children as well that there are plans done by us. Uh, but then the greater plan is Allah's plan and he is the best planner and he would do whatever is good for us, even if it doesn't seem good. And I think Hudaybiyah was um, a breath of fresh air, even in this despair situation. And as you mentioned that how uh, Prophet ﷺ was getting anxious when they could not, when they were not really slaughtering um, a lot of uh, uh, critics of Islam said that Muhammad Wasallam's companion were not listening to him, but that wasn't the case. They were desperately waiting for Jibril to come and probably say that, oh, no, you have to carry on march in, in Mecca. But, uh, and that was the reason they weren't moving. But as soon as Prophet Wasallam uh, put uh, in action, you know, the, the slaughtering, they just they just followed uh, uh, followed him, and that shows their obedience uh, to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and this is how we should be, uh, you know, when we are listening to our ulama and scholars, we are so we we criticize them so much, and that is also one of a very sad situation of ummah, and uh, that we are very. Um, you know, without having our own knowledge, we we criticize uh, our ulma. So we need to be a little bit. This this also show us this um, obedience. Um, and yes, you've um, the, the Hudaybiyah is is something that we need to remember. Um, and then uh, Shofa, how you explain that how. It all went so smoothly that it's the first time um, the little state of Medina was doing uh, dawa rather than defending themselves in the war. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wrote letters to heads of uh, nations all around him, the Byzantine Empire, the Persian Empire, and he sent uh, uh, people, he sent his Sahaba uh, to propagate Islam. So that was uh, that was the time that Allah gave them to 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 flourish uh, through da'wah. I think I talked quite a lot. 
because I know there was time. So if anybody else want to uh, give their feedback. Inshallah, um, next week will be few topics together and I will be covering it. Uh, uh, we we didn't want you to put too much on Sister Shofa's uh, plate for the first time. We just wanted to show how kind we are. <laughs> um, uh, inshallah, we will be we will be continuing uh, next week. Um, we will do uh, how at the end uh, this the Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu and his companion end up doing the the Umrah. So they did do the Umrah next next year. That was one of the um, you know clause of the con um, treaty that Muslims will be allowed uh, next week. So we will be doing that, and uh, we will be doing uh, um, few other few other topics. And very important topic will be the conquer uh, conquering of Mecca and how that was done. It's so emotional. It's really emotional, and it's. Again, it's packed with uh, with lessons for us. So um, yes, we will be finishing early tonight. Um, so if anybody wants to say anything, please don't hesitate. Um, otherwise, we will just um, do our um, darud and uh, say good night to each other. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu alla ilaha illant astaghfiruka wa tu wa. Tubu ilai, Alhamma Sali, Alam Hamadi, Wala Ali Muhammad, Kama Salaita, Ala Ibrahim, Wala Ali Ibrahim, in Naka Hamid Majid, Lahuma Barikala Muhammad, in Wala Ali Muhammad, Kama Barik, Ala Ibrahim, Wala Ali Ibrahim, in Naka Hamid Majid. Tazakala, sister. Tazakumullah. Salam alaikum.